Okay. So uh, without further ado, let's jump right, right in because there are many slides and very few minutes. Okay. So uh, you guys probably all know why you're here. So here's a little agenda. We'll keep going with that. We'll get, we'll get through it hopefully. I'll do a little bit turbo version. So if I talk too fast, just kind of raise your hand and I'll uh, try to slow down a little bit. But I have to go quick. So uh, let's jump right in and talk about Android. Oh, wait. I skipped the intro. Let's go. So I'm Josh. I uh, go by JDuck on the internet. Some of you may or may not have interacted with me. Uh, I welcome you to say hello anytime. Uh, I, currently, I work for Zimperium doing uh, mobile defense research. It's excellent to work. Uh, lead author of Android Hackers Handbook and founder of DroidSec, which we'll be having a little event somewhere in the building later. So if you see us drinking, join us. Uh, previous affiliations, you know, all this old stuff. So my motivations in doing this research really were to improve the overall state of mobile security, right? Uh, especially in Android. Uh, the, we, we're, there's just been years and years of people talking about all these problems in Android. And I'm like, I got to be able to do something about that. And so I kind of decided to do what I do best, which is discover and eliminate critical vulnerabilities. Uh, and also exploit them to show people that, uh, that they're real. You know, they're not, not some BS. I'm trying to save my phone battery. There we go. All right, so I also wanted to you know, spur people to start thinking a lot harder on some of the mobile security issues so that they could really make the improvements in their organizations that they needed to. Uh, I wanted to increase visibility of risky code in Android. There's a lot of code in Android. It's like 60 gigs of stuff. Uh, and apparently, people don't read any of it, as you'll see later. And also, last year, I gave a talk at Black Hat and a couple of other conferences about the Droid Army. Basically, I collect Android devices, have them all connected right now through USB to a computer, can query them at any time across versions, across OEMs, across CPUs, whatever. Uh, so I want to use that some more. So I want to thank the sponsors. I started this work when I worked with Document, uh, who is now Optive. They graciously allowed me to take this research on with me and, and see it through to the end. Uh, or at least, I guess I wouldn't really call this the end, but at least do this. I want to thank Amir. Is Amir here? Amir, come on. You missed both talks, Amir. Man, I'll get him later, don't worry. All right, so I also want to thank Colin and Matt Solnick. Are they in the room? They're probably not either. Okay, they're both fired too. Uh, all right, so what is Stage Fright? Stage Fright is Android's media multi, uh, multimedia library. Uh, it's primarily written in C++. There are some parts of it that are written in Java. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. It handles basically all audio and video on the device. Uh, it's meant to stand as a, a, a kind of go-between uh, between the Dalvik applications and other sort of high-level stuff in Android uh, and the hardware, because a lot of Android devices actually have hardware video decoders. Uh, so, yeah, it also extracts metadata, which we'll see is kind of important. So a brief history, Android, uh, back in the 1.0, 1.5 days, they launched with a, an engine, a media multimedia engine called OpenCore, which was apparently donated to them by some random organization. Uh, later, during the 2.0 development, they added stage fright to the AOSP. However, they weren't really using it. It was kind of like they were starting to develop it. Uh, in 2.2, they made it optional to use, so they had a, like a setting that you could set in the system properties. Uh, but all the devices I had with 2.2, which isn't very many, they had it enabled by default, so I just assumed everyone would do that. That's a pretty good assumption, I think. Uh, I also saw some really nice forum posts where everyone were like, oh, we need to enable stage right because it's fast and open core is slow and sucks. So, anyway. So... So at 2.3, uh, Gingerbread, you know, we're talking about 2010, I think, time frame here. They uh, set this as a default engine and then got rid of OpenCore entirely. A side note, this, this code was pulled into Firefox and Firefox OS. Well, Firefox OS is a fork of Android at the beginning, so that's not really a surprise. But they also decided to pull it into Firefox, ship it on all versions of Firefox except Android. Uh, sorry, except Linux uh, around version 17. So why did, why did I look at stage fright? What, what was the big deal? Uh, you know, honestly, I can't remember exactly why I started looking at it. It might be the name. When you kind of look through, you're like, ah, oh, stage fright. That sounds interesting. Sounds scary, right? Uh, 
So definitely a big plus if you want to audit some code to look for native code. It's oftentimes much buggier than Java code. A um, lot more ways to screw that up. And also a lot of times the people who do end up writing native code often are not very good at writing native code. They don't really understand what they're necessarily doing. Um, and so that's cool, especially with respect to security. So also there's various public mentions. So people on uh, Reddit and other places posting saying, uh, my phone keeps rebooting randomly and you know you read down and somebody's like, well you have a militia, uh, sorry, you have a corrupt uh, file on your SD card or something. And so I was like, that, that sounds really bad. It's gotta be pretty bad code. I have to check that out. And then finally, like there was some related work that was published semi recently in April uh, where I was like, you know, that is really cool stuff. Um, maybe I should do a talk on that stuff. So uh, we'll talk more about the, some of the issues reported in this one. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. These guys fuzzed the crap out of uh, basically stage fright directly on Android emulators, I think. Uh, and they work for Intel, so they were x86 Android emulators. And basically they said they had like 11.5 terabytes of media files that they, that they created that crashed uh, stage fright which was pretty intense. That's more data than I think anyone is gonna go through. So they reported some bugs and we'll, we'll talk about it a little more later. So another, another related work was there was this uh, paper about black box fuzzing on mobile devices. This is uh, pretty much what I did uh, in part of it. So it's definitely related and they also talk about some, uh, some of the stuff they had found in uh, stage fright. So uh, related work, uh, really old stuff, is Charlie Miller's talk where he talked about Android hacking like back before Android was even released. Uh, he found uh, a vulnerability in a uh, multimedia file that he reported. But this was, this was so, so long ago that it was on OpenCore, not on Stage Fright. So Stage Fright is pretty big. It's about, I think, something like 10,000 lines of code. Um, prob probably actually more than that. Uh, and it supports a wide variety of multimedia file formats. There's a spot in the code where you can literally look at this one function and it's like, if it's this format, do this, if it's this format, do that. You know, and then you can see which way it goes. Mo most of the code that they support in, in Stage Fright is backed by common open source libraries like libvorbis or libflack or opus or vpx, all these other kind of open source libraries which are projects of their own. Uh, however, there is also a bunch of code that it lives directly in stage fright. And so that was my focus. I decided to pick MP4. Uh, I thought it was, you know, relatively uh, straightforward file format, uh, but you know, I thought it'd be a good one to, to mess around with. Uh, so the rest of this talk will primarily focus on MPEG-4 stuff for the examples uh, and findings. So system architecture, let's talk about how it looks on a system, where this code runs. Uh, a little bit of high level, this is the, the new diagram that, they like to, that they're like they showing on the developer site. Uh, it's pretty cool and now they're calling out media server specifically. I'm not really sure why they decided to do that. There's many more things that run in the background besides system server and media server. Uh, what they do is a lot of uh, inter-process communication to talk between processes. Basically, uh, media server is running as a background native service. It starts from an it, uh, and in Android, I've heard somebody told me recently that this wasn't necessarily the case in older versions, but uh, in Android now, if something that's running from an it crashes, it's just automatically restarted. So we'll revisit the init thing a little bit. There's also some other things that it affects uh, we'll talk about again. So let's look at privileges, right? Like what do you get if you pop this thing? That's, that's very interesting to find out, I think. Uh, and this is actually another reason why I looked at this service. Uh, remember, I wrote a little tool called PrivMap to look at processes and see what they were running as. And uh, this one stood out as like having some potentially like silly permissions right away. So you can see at the bottom line of the of the kind of like quoted text area that they have all these groups there. So actually, the media server, although you would think it's been sandboxed and moved and segregated in order to limit risk of the code, they're actually like making it very privileged, uh, in order, I guess, in order to do what it needs to do for the most part. Uh, so, for example, the audio group is used to lock down access to the, the speakers and the microphone. Uh, if you have the audio group, then you can do anything with an input and output of audio. Uh, camera, using a similar thing, INET, um, 
there's actually things within media, uh, um, stage fright and other parts of media server that require connecting back to the internet. The, the biggest example being uh, DRM media, which will have to go out and get a license for that when you try to play it. Uh, and, and then you know, also the, you, you can see the groups here for DRM. So I did this survey of the Droid Army. Uh, I wanted to figure out, oh, yeah, this is that slide. So I made this slide. I have no idea what this number means on the left. Accessible group sorted by number of devices. And these numbers don't make sense to me. 17 doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem like a number that would jive with what I wrote here. So I will look into that later and fix it when I publish the slides. Uh, all right, so I, I did some more surveying, you know, just besides this, whatever the hell that set is. <laughs> I think maybe maybe it was the breakdown of devices. Okay, yeah. So this is how many devices I looked at out of the fifty-one were from Google or for were from Motorola or from Samsung. So this kind of gives you a little bit of a, a overview of what what my Droid Army collection looks like. Uh, okay, so the this, the privilege survey. I want to look at each group and see how many devices had which groups. So. You can see they all say 51 on the left because these, these groups are on all devices. So we already talked about what you can do with that. It's pretty bad. Uh, so let's look at the other groups that are hanging out. We start with uh, this bandwidth, bandwidth accounting thing. I think that's really pretty much uninteresting. Uh, but then you have DRM RPC. Uh, usually that is used to talk directly into Trust Zone, uh, which Trust Zone is a very sort of interesting attack surface, I think, on Android devices. Because it's, it's kind of like ring negative one, right? So it's, it's above the kernel. It's more privileged than the kernel. Uh, and so then you have the next one, which is system. So system is the number two sort of user on Android. It's, it, it owns the slash data partition. So everything that's writable on slash data is writable by that user. And if it's not writable, since he owns slash data, you can just move it out of the way and put whatever you want there in its place. So... System is a very high privilege. It's, it's really just under root, and it's well, well thought of in, in the research community in Android that if you have system, that getting root is pretty much just an engineering effort, not really a, a, too much of a serious full research effort. So then we have the next one is graphics. So graphics was, is used to lock down basically the frame buffer devices for Android, uh, and there have been numerous vulnerabilities discovered and exploited in the frame buffer stuff. I think that right now it's pretty solid. Uh, but I couldn't be proven wrong, of course. So we keep going down the list and we've got input. That means uh, if somebody gets a device, one of these eight devices, and they get through, they get in through media server on that, then they can watch your keystrokes or inject keystrokes into your uh, use of the device. Uh, at the bottom, you have shell. So shell is the user they assign to ADB shell. I have no idea why they would give that to media server at all. Uh, it blows my mind, really. But it's interesting. And then the last one's radio. So radio is the, basically right below system in that uh, if you have radio, you can make calls, send MMS, man in the middle, all communications with the cellular network. You can take down cellular network uh, uh, connection that you have. Uh, so it, it basically runs all the stuff that's between the cell network and the rest of Android. Okay, so architecture recap. Uh, Lib stage fright runs inside media server. Media server is fairly privileged, including sometimes system. Uh, it automatically restarts whenever it crashes. It's, it's a fairly large attack service that's provided based on all these groups that you're, give, that you're given. Uh, the path from remote to the kernel through another vulnerability that, that, that you have to find in a driver or something is probably not too difficult because of all this extra attack service that's uh, being uh, given to you once you're in with those privileges. So let's talk about the attack surface of Android. Um, basically, in order to figure out what's going on with the code, I, I just opened up in the, a, a movie while I had a debugger attached. Uh, I put a breakpoint just on the open thing. I was like, OK, we're going to play a file, so it's got to open it. So I, I, and then I went ahead, I looked back, and started digging around in the code. So here's what a, kind of the backtrace looks like. You can see I'm playing the playing.mp4 file, and you can see all the different functions that are called in the process, including some paths to where they are in the AOSP code base. So when you start looking closer, you can see like the set data source function. Uh, I think it's like, is it, so it's not even showing right here, but uh, basically, 
you can see where at the top it calls create from URI, and then after that it calls this media extractor. And so we start looking at that, and we end up with uh, this function that loops through all the tracks that you count. When you look at that, it says read metadata. So in order to find out how many tracks there are in a media file, you got to find out, you know, you have to extract the, the, the metadata because that's where it stores that information. So we look at that, and it just goes into this function parse chunk. So let's look at that here a little bit. So the parse chunk function is the primary attack surface inside stage fright's MP4 parsing code. Uh, it's a recursive function, so when it sees an atom that's supposed to have more atoms inside of it, uh, and when I say atom, I'm talking about a tag length data uh, piece of the file. So they just, put, I think actually they put it length tag data, but uh, anyway, that's what it is. <laughs> Hi guys. Hey Amir, come in here. Let, let the guy in the green shirt and his lovely wife in here, please. Yes, those two. Yes, and the lovely wife, of course. Thank you. you missed your shout out again, but now you're here. <laughs> Give it up for Amir. All right. So when you look at Android, uh, at, at all versions, like across the AOSP, which is beautiful because Git is wonderful. I love Git. Uh, you see that earlier versions had about 80 Atom supported and newer versions have about 140. So it's roughly almost double the amount of code over the course of the development. So we'll look, we'll look a little closer later, but you can see here an example where the move and the track uh, chunks are especially handling, handled where they say, oh, well, we have more chunks inside, so it recurses. And the recursion is really not relevant other than it's um, annoying to debug recursive code sometimes, but that's great. Let's keep going. Let's talk about attack vectors. So the, uh, when I talk about attack surface, I'm always thinking about things that are deep in the code that you're trying to tickle and try to find the vulns in. And when I talk about attack vectors, I'm thinking about all the ways to get there. So the, the ultimate goal in uh, looking for attack vectors is to figure out, like I said, how to get my data in there. Oh, I'm in trouble now. So uh, first, you can try all possible ways to send yourself a media file. Unfortunately, it depends on. No, no, no. Go ahead. All right. You want to try? Sure. All right. Go ahead. A thorough methodology. Find all calls into this function and ask yourself: Can an attacker's data reach here? How am I doing? You're you're good. <laughs> you're good. Maybe I should try that more. You need to work on your graphics. I, so if you had any idea how hard it was to do graphics in this, in this presentation framework, you wouldn't this, say that. This would be perfect. <laughs> just, just put a picture of a waterfall in the background. Waterfall? Make everybody have to go to the bathroom. So, uh, so you just repeat this process until you find them all, right? Uh, the, the problem with, no, you, you can't really know necessarily w without uh, looking all through the code all the ways it's possible. So there's some problems with doing the second methodology, the one that's more thorough, and after you have to deal with all these complicated issues, like uh, there is a place inside uh, media server in this code path, it actually calls into and out of Java code like back and forth about three times in one stack trace. So that's pretty wild, you gotta open a lot of files and have them all kinda in the background or however. Excuse me. Yes, sir? This one is not. Do we have a, sir? Let me come around the other side. work on this. Let's dance. All right. Are we live yet? Awesome. All right, now, how many are first timers at DEF CON? Awesome, but you all know the drill by now. What do first time speakers do? Awesome. So how's he doing, by the way? Jeez. I stop him. Right. Slow down, Speedy. All right. Anyway, so um, it's yeah. very hard to become a speaker <laughs> at DEF CON. We like to honor them with a little tradition we call Shot the Noob. Cheers. 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 To DEF CON. To DEF CON. As you were. Thank you, my friends. I owe you a shot. Yes. You can do it right now. <laughs> can we do it after? All right, let's do it after. 
All right, so the other thing is there's a lot of object-oriented code. We mentioned C++, we mentioned Java. So that oftentimes when you're like auditing code paths or looking, or trying to understand the code, you have to do all this crappy stuff where you remember the member functions and variables and all these crazy classes and stuff. So then again, more files to have open. It's fun. Uh, you have to be careful about object instantiation and lifetimes and things like that. Uh, further, on Android, because of the modularity and the IPC, you end up having to sometimes cross boundaries that are like between processes. That can be hard to follow, uh, but you can get through it if you keep trying. Sometimes you might have to take a break or a nap or something. I know that works for me. So that's the best way, all possible ways. Go to the code, right? And the, if you want to know what the code does, it's in the code, so go there. So the first vector I kind of stumbled upon or, or thought about was the video tag in HTML5. I was like, this is brand new. I, I wonder if it does it. So I fire up the device with the debugger attached to the parse chunk function, or the, actually the read metadata function, which is a little bit better. If you, hit, if you put a breakpoint on parse chunk, it's great, but as soon as you hit the first chunk, uh, it'll break, but then every other chunk it hits, even when it's recursing into more chunks, it'll keep getting hit. So it's pretty annoying to just keep saying continue all the time. So uh, it definitely hit the breakpoint, and so uh, I went on and tried to, I was like, you know, Thomas Cannon back in the day talked about this way to force Android to download files, uh, and he used it in some sort of uh, vulnerability that, was, that would load JavaScript through uh, a weird content provider or something. So uh, you, this is actually a straight screenshot other than the, the part on the left where the path is wrong in the URL, but anyway, um, so you go, and as soon as you touch this link, you see this page in the middle, which could be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, what it is right now with this big white screen. It could be like cat pictures or, how, or whatever you want. Uh, you see this downloading toast come up, which disappears after basically like one second. The only other indication that you did anything, downloading anything, is this little downward arrow with a line at the top. Now, if you swipe down from the top and touch that, It'll tell you that you downloaded a file. You can touch that, and you see what's on the right. Now, the trick, the, the 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 crappy and scary thing is here that the the vulnerable code, the the stage fright code, is actually triggered as soon as the file is downloaded, and it does not require you to go and open the media or touch it or look at it or anything like that. So that's interesting. Oh, look. Uh, I also did a feature request. I was like, hey, can we like get some kind of prompting for this? Like, I don't really want to auto-download stuff. Uh, I mean, I'd expect a link that I click to cause a download. So maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, so when I looked deeper into how this worked, I decided to take a step back and say, how, how is this working? Uh, what I found was that this, this uh, whole subsystem called the media scanner, and so uh, the only thing really documented uh, in AOSP that is for people to use uh, as developers is the media scanner connection. And really all that does, you know, you create an, an object and you say, scan this file, and that's really it. Uh, the other thing is they're in the intent documentation, so there's the intent class in the Java stuff for, for Android. They have this long, 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 long list of uh, intents that are supported in the system they have these two media mounted and media scanner scan file. Uh, so those are documented as well, although they're like basically one line in a huge table. Uh, it, and then if you look closer, it, there's this class that's used a lot internally in the code, media scanner cli uh, connection client. That one actually uh, is used a lot. Uh, so I don't want to go too much deeper into this. I actually, when I was making the slides, I like went all crazy deep and then I was like, you know what, there's no way I can talk about that. It's like a whole other talk right there. So I put it at the back of the slide deck, so when you get a slide deck, you can go back there and check it out. Uh, so tons of attack factors, right? We're talking about, once I went through the methodology, I looked at all these different ways to call into this code, the media scanner, uh, and uh, all in the stage fright other ways. I basically found that you can do through MMS, it triggers this code because it's showing you a thumbnail of the, of the video. It, even if it didn't show you a thumbnail and it just wanted to know how many seconds long the thing was, that would still trigger it. So um, there's client side, as we mentioned, browser and download. There's also email. So if you get an email uh, with an attachment on Android, it'll basically say it has an attachment, but it won't download it automatically. You have to like push the button to download the attachment. And when it's downloaded, of course, it will scan it. How nice. Um, so, the, so to back up just one for one second, there. There's a way inside of these APIs to actually tell it 
uh, so not media scanner stuff, but a lot of these attack vectors uh, use the download manager, the download, and that's what I talk about a lot in the bonus slides, the download manager. Um, there's ways to call in the download manager where it tells it not to scan the file. However, everywhere where I saw in the code where they said don't scan the file when you download it, immediately afterwards they called the media scanner on the file. So, okay. So physically adjacent, you know, that's stuff like, you know, we're all in the same room together. Uh, or in the case of NFC, you're a little bit closer. But th these are also attack vectors. Uh, if you have an SD card slot on your device, somebody could totally insert an SD card in your device and potentially compromise it. Uh, or an OTG drive if your device supports that special USB mode. Uh, and then there's the MTP PTP mode. This has been the default mode on Android devices, including Nexus devices, since 4.0. I have a whole bunch of other research into this subsystem, but uh, it's not going to fit here. Uh, and, and so if, if you connect with the device to your computer with this mode and you transfer a media file to it, it will also scan it. Uh, so I say 11 plus attack vectors, but really if you think about it, anywhere that a media that is thumbnailed or like in any way like probed for metadata will trigger the stage fright code. So do you guys use any of these to talk to people you don't trust? or? Even worse, do any do you think anybody who you don't trust could somehow communicate with you without you asking with any of these? So the scariest part is MMS by far. Uh, my research initially was on doing stuff over the SD card. As I discovered the media mounted intent, which basically says you know, when you stick the SD card in, the volume manager says hey, there's a new SD card mounted, and then the media scanner does its thing. So that's where I started, and then eventually, through the attack vector research, I found MMS, and I was like, wait, that, that can be good. Uh, so one day, I just was messing around. I sent myself a video, totally legit, right? Not a malicious video at all. Just sent it to myself with the debugger attached, of course, and my, my screen was off, the phone was locked on the table, uh, and it hit the, it hit the break point. I'm just like, what? Are you are you kidding me? Uh, so before even creating a notification, it's like trying to get a screenshot uh, uh, of this video, and then it's going to put it at least on newer versions. It will put it straight in the uh, the notification. Let's see if I have some pictures. I don't know if I have some pictures in this. Ah, yeah. You're right. I need more pictures. So uh, I even have some. I just put them in here. So in theory, uh, hey Dan, how are you? So in theory, if you exploit this vulnerability through MS and you do some pretty neat engineering work, you could potentially stop the whole process of the MS going through. You could delete it uh, from whatever, wherever it's stored. You could stop the audio notification because you've already taken control of the process that does all audio, uh, and then you can, you know, they would nobody would know anything even if they were using their device at the time. So that's, that is a theoretically possible thing and it freaks me the fuck out. I don't know about you guys. Uh, but it is a lot more work. I did not do that work. That's, I don't want to do that work. So where does it work? Uh, so the MMS stuff works in Hangouts. Uh, further testing later, like I guess a couple weeks ago, the new version of the, the, the app Messenger, uh, which is kind of like the, the, the throwback of the old messaging app that they removed uh, in newer versions. Also does uh, a lot of processing automatically, and especially on receipt. Uh, the older version does not do it. Although you know, if somebody sends you an MMS message, you can imagine, even if you don't know who it is, and it's like, "Hey, did you see this video of you?" You, you might want to be like, "Me?" And then you look at it, and then you're done. So turn off auto retrieve if you guys use Hangouts or Messenger uh, because it's nasty. It's a uh, Wormable, potentially. So uh, the vulnerable code is invoked all the time. I, uh, this device here, uh, I think I disabled the app, but it, if you have an MMS that, that just comes in in messaging in this in this phone, uh, like if you're looking at it, it triggers the vulnerability. If you turn the screen sideways, it redraws the activity and then triggers the vulnerability again. You do that again, triggers the vulnerability again. You lock the screen and then you unlock it, triggers the vulnerability again. So basically anytime it's drawing the screen, it's like that's another trigger. 
So are there any other attack factors? I do not know. I get this. I got this question a lot on Twitter. Like, is silent text affected? Is like the WhatsApp affected? I, was like, I don't know. I don't use any of those things because you know a lot of times when a lot of people jump onto a technology, it becomes kind of like a, a big risk in itself. Uh, so reach out if you have any ideas or any thoughts or you do any testing. I'd love to hear about that sort of stuff. So let's get into the into bugs. And I think I have like ten minutes or something. Is that not right? Who's got the timer? 13, and I'm on slide 41. Oh, we can do this, yeah, we can do this. All right, so the basic methodology was to just to write a fuzzer, a simple one, really dumb, that will just process media repeatedly, repeatedly, and while it's running, go read some code, uh, and if it crashes, then go read the code where it crashed, because obviously that's gotta be some pretty bad code. You just do that until, again, your brain melts and you wanna go nap or whatever. First round, uh, the, the details, um, again, focused on MP4, we didn't bother to create a, a, a large corpus. We basically just used uh, a one, one media file or, or two. I can't see my cursor. Is it over there? Yeah, there it is. Maybe we can play the video that, that we used for fuzzing. It's a total waste of time, but it'll be funny. Yeah. It's not normal to use a computer screen that's 20 feet from you. So yes, Amir, thank you for that. That was badass. Uh, so you can imagine it was a lot of fun hearing that sound over and over again. And when you don't hear it, you're like, hmm, wonder what happened then. So we deposited it for about a week, and we found 6,200 crashes. Uh, I went through all these crashes and bucketed them and then looked deeper into them. And unfortunately, the crashes we found from the fuzzer were all very sort of non-interesting bugs. They're like checking if something is zero, and if it's not, the guys who wrote stage fright decided they were going to kill themselves and crash the whole process, thus making you lose audio and everything else. Uh, but So about 20 bugs, but they're not that awesome. A lot of no point of references as well. But when I was looking at the code, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, that's lame, but let's look around like maybe just at this function. And within two or three lines, there was just uh, very important vulnerabilities. So I found about five during code review then. They became these two CVEs. The first one uh, was like kind of a merger of, of several issues because of similar root cause and affected versions. So on the second round, we decided to, to throw American Fuzzy Lop. Uh, I don't, how many people have heard of American Fuzzy Lop? He, oh, he loves it. He's used it. How many people have actually used it? We got really like not very many people who said they heard of it even. So I got three that used it and like 10 heard it, heard of it, right? Okay, so American Fuzzy Lop is a fuzzer developed by uh, Michael Zalewski. He's been in the security industry for a very long time. And uh, basically he came up with this idea of like, let's look at the way code flows. And if code flows from here to here, then let's treat that as like a transition and keep track of like, I guess like three things, right? A three, like a try. And then it goes, he's like, if there's a new one of these three things, like code flowed from here to here instead of from here to there, then that's new, that's good, we want more. So his goal in creating this fuzzer, it wasn't really necessarily to find crashes, although that's always gonna happen when you do a lot of t automated testing. Um, his goal was more to find new code base, uh, new code paths uh, with the purpose of building corpuses in a more programmatic uh, and more sort of intentional way, rather than, you know, the traditional other way is to go download all the files you can find and then run them through this like long process where you see like what code does it hit, um, which not very much fun. So uh, I didn't really, again, develop a corpus. The thing is with AFL, you don't really need one. So I'm just kind of like echo, yo, 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 into the file and then I ran it. Uh, and it went really well. So the work involved, I had to develop a harness, basically just calling the stage fright code. Uh, I ran AFL on my Linux server that I just got. It was like 32 core machine, double high fives. Okay, so, uh, and every once in a while, like I guess every day or so, maybe two days, I would stop the fuzzer, go all through the results, triage them and bucket them, and then look at each individual unique thing and try my best, and usually I got it on the first try, but sometimes it, I had to do a little more deep analysis to fix the vulnerabilities before I would start the fuzzer running again. The idea being, 
what is the point of finding the same freaking vulnerability 800,000 times? Not really fun. So this slide is super cool. I don't think I finished it, but let's go hit it anyway. Length of testing, we tested it for about two, maybe three weeks, off and on, and going through that methodology. The speed uh, was about 3,200 executions per second, so it was about 1,000 executions per second per core. Uh, and we found a lot of bugs. Uh, you know, and when I say I was fixing vulnerabilities, like that includes no plenty of references. I'm like, I, you know, ah, that's land crash. Like, let's get it out of here. Uh, so that's nice. Get, them, get rid of the noise. So that resulted in uh, some more bugs. You can see the, the first four actually, and so I guess that slide before was a little bit inaccurate. Those first four were the ones I found during the first round, and the remaining, uh, was that five or six? six. Those, the other six came up during the second round, uh, in addition to all the no pointer reference and stuff, which don't, they didn't get assigned CVs. So let's look at uh, that issue that I said we'd look at again from the other related work. So around a year ago, they pushed a fix into AOSP from those guys who did the fuzzing, uh, Intel. Uh, here, and here they say, check integer overflow during the table alloc. These three bugs, great. Uh, so I looking closer, I saw this go in, like the, day the Android 5.0 was released, and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so I, 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 here's the, the new code. You can see they're assigning uh, the result of some math to a 64-bit unsigned integer. That looks like it would be good, right? Uh, but is it? So I thought it was. I thought this was good, by the way. I don't know where I went just now. So uh, I thought this was good. I was like, oh, they fixed that one. That's awful. But uh, let's just keep going. So I, I, when I was running AFL, I actually found this crash over and over again. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought they fixed it. Well, it turns out when you multiply a bunch of 32 32-bit integers together uh, and assign them to 64-bit integers, it does all the math first in a 32-bit sort of way, and then it just go, uh, goes ahead and assigns the result to the 64-bit integer. Uh, so there's no promotion happening at all when just because of the assignment. Uh, and so the fix, and I don't think I even have the fix in here, but the fix was basically just casting one of them to a 64-bit integer, any one of them. It could have been the two, it could have been the size of, it could have been any of them. Uh, so, the, so these vulnerabilities remain, even they, they basically zero did themselves by saying, come look at this, uh, although it did look like it was fixed. So let's talk about exploitability, uh, and I'm totally going to run out of time, but, but let's just go faster. So many of, the, many of these bones uh, result in memory corruption and heat memory. Uh, these have been proven, proven exploitable lots and lots of times, especially in C++ code, given that they often have uh, virtual function pointer tables and other sort of strange things going on in, in heap memory. Uh, so mitigations do come into play, though, and diversity, although it is a barrier to performing the research, as in it will make it take more time, it doesn't necessarily prevent something like a worm, which, which could just build support for as many things as it knows about into itself. So media server recap, uh, we talked about this before, but let's talk about it in a frame of exploitation. So we have a NIT starting, uh, starting media servers. That means two things. Uh, on the positive side, that means this weakness that's been in Android since the beginning and is still there, uh, where Zygo, as apps are created, they all have the same address layout at their birth because it forks, but it does not exec. Now, it, and it does fork and exec, so every time it crashes, the address space will be completely more uh, randomized again. Uh, and this only applies to newer devices, uh, 4.0 and later, that have ASLR at all. So, uh, but on the downside, because it restarts whenever it crashes, you can just trigger it over and over and over and over and over, and over again, uh, although that does depend on attack vector. You can't imagine some guy who's going to download your email attachments and look at them over and over and over again. He's going to get kind of fed up. Uh, so it also means you can, is that word possible or poisable? That's, that's new. So uh, you can also bypass with the shared root force. So another thing is multiple threading in media server. Uh, basically has some threads that listen for binder events, which are completely uncontrollable by an attacker because they're coming from outside. Uh, means that there's a little bit of lack of determinism in the heap, uh, heap layout. So apart from ASLR, even if it was all not randomized, uh, chunks might get in the way and such and cause a real a little bit of a, a, a boundary. Right, so 
How many slides do I got left? So new in Android 5.0. Okay, so Android 5.0 added a mitigation that uh, most people were probably not aware of. In fact, the guys who actually make Android were probably not aware that they got this. Uh, and basically, uh, the code here in the top block, it's doing a new uh, number of elements of an array, create, creating an array with new bracket bracket. Um, GCC, they finally like added a, a way to catch this sort of problem. Uh, where the integer overflow happens kind of intrinsically inside of what's generated by the compiler. Right. This, uh, I don't have a link right now, but the work that these guys did is a ticket that's almost 10 years old. So the compiler team in Android decided to switch to GCC 5.0, maybe because it matched Android 5.0, I'm not sure, but the, they decided to do that. So let's, break, let's look at a breakdown of the big important mitigations on Android and how they apply to vulnerabilities in stage right. So SE Linux pretty much doesn't come into effect unless you're already in. So if you get in, it may limit you from what you can talk to, although you know, if you have a vulnerable audio driver, clearly you can talk to the audio driver. Uh, they're not going to SE Linux block you from the audio driver. Uh, stack cookie is completely irrelevant because there's not stack corruption going on. Fortify source, irrelevant because these are all dynamically allocated heap buffers, and Fortify source has no visibility into dynamic memory allocation. Uh, ASLR, as we said, it only applies. We got another 10 minutes? Yeah. I thought that was GTFO. No, no. So, so what's going on is. Or big ups. Uh, Let's just keep going. I understand. Yeah. I'll get, I'll, you just drag me off when you're ready. Okay. So, so basically, uh, what we're attempting to do is we're going to hold this, uh, this track. will go a little bit longer. We're going to hold this track and go a little bit longer. I'm almost done. Well, I'll take some questions. Okay. I want to do a demo first, though. All right. All right. So NX is not a big deal. You can bypass it with ROP. ASLR, again, some stuff. Uh, the newer versions, uh, it's still probably possible to bypass ASLR in newer versions. It just requires either brute forcing, statistical guessing, maybe an information lake vulnerability, or it might require you to do some really neat tricks with uh, because it's only a 30 bit layout. Uh, so exploitability, uh, definitely on old versions, very badly, definitely on old versions. Uh, the newer versions, yeah, I think it's doable, and I, I want to spend some more time with it, but right now I do not have time because I am speaking to you guys on stage. So I think I have somewhere on this computer a window that has stuff in it. Not the cat window. Let's try this one. Is that good? Can you guys read that in the back, the text? Or do I need to make it super bigger? If you can read, I got a thumbs up from row like negative three. Bigger, okay, bigger. Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Is that good enough? All right. Uh, where is my mouse? It's on the wrong screen here. All right. So I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, at Black Hat, I did not do a live demo, uh, but let's try it. Uh, we got a device right here. I'm deleting the messages I sent myself in the speaker room. Okay, so I'm just going to leave the screen on right here, and then we'll, I think, run this exploit just like this. Uh, so one point of importance is that this attack right now is not going over a carrier network. Uh, that kind of is a violation of the end user license agreement and terms of conditions that you use the network. So uh, this is going over a, a, tool, a tool chain basically that allows me to pretend like messages are coming in from the carrier network uh, and then also host my own uh, MMSC server. So let's just run it. So this made a big old two meg video file and it sent it down this channel. I don't know, you guys probably can't see this, I'm just looking like an idiot over here. I didn't get any messages yet either. This is why you don't do live demos, because people show up to your talk and they bring stuff like rogue base stations. I still haven't got a message yet, although I see it transferring something. I want to show you guys the screen, but it's like, uh, it's tricky. It's tricky to show you both of the screens at the same time. Open what? Photo boo. Ooh. 
I think I have like something get user media. I can't see it down there. So I still haven't got a message. I think we're just going to go back to the video because this is retarded. Uh, I'm really disappointed because this exploit works like every time, but not on always on the first try, unfortunately. Except for right now, because of whatever reason that's preventing it from working. It looks like a network issue. So let's play the video. It'll be more fun. And it's got cool music by Archive Architect. I got an idea. I thought you guys said we had an audio thing in there. So the first time we did it with the screen off just to show you that like there's no indication that anything happened. Thank you. So also when the screen's off, the device goes low power mode and it goes very slow. This privilege escalation is old, old, old bug, so. That's the thing about old devices is, um, you know, uh, they're easy to exploit and they're also full of old bugs that give you root. So that makes it extra bad there. Thank you. I don't know how to do this. They hooked me up before. You coming to beat me and boot me off stage now? I do have a couple more slides that I'll just kind of do this. Uh, uh, I told people. Do not go out the side door. Go out the back. That doesn't work. I'm talking to this. Go out the back, not the side. Don't go out the side, please. So I hope you guys get an update soon. I think they're rolling out now.